All right. Yep. I want to welcome everybody. This is Stephen Key and Andrew Kraus. And tonight, this is IGA and Vintage Groups of America. I want to welcome everybody. If you would please, in the chat, uh, type in where you're from. That's always interest, interesting to see people from all around the world. So please do that when you have a minute. I want to talk very briefly about IGA. First of all, we're going to record this, so please don't discuss anything that's confidential. Um, in Vintage Groups of America, it was created, I don't know, five or six years ago. I'm not quite sure. It's been such a long time. And it was created because Andrew and I felt that the clubs around the country really need to get together and they, get, they need to get to know each other. So it was really started with us helping the club presidents and their members to commercialize their ideas, either through licensing or venturing, but bringing everybody together. But what's happened, it's kind of grown from that. And now we have people from all over the world coming in and participating once a month to our webinars that were like one of the webinars we're going to hold tonight. And we've had some really amazing guests. We have the new director. We've had a lot of successful inventors, but we have a special guest tonight. We have Kevin Prince. He's a patent agent. And I also want to say a couple of things about Kevin before we, we get started, because we do have a lot of stuff to cover tonight. I've been filing intellectual property, geez, since, I don't know, the 90s, I guess, um, early 90s. And I've worked with a lot of different size uh, firms. I've, I've worked with uh, big law firms, small law, law firms. I've worked with patent agents like Kevin, but I can tell you, it doesn't matter the size. If, if, it really matters if you're going to get good intellectual property, it really depends on the person you're working with. It depends on the person that really cares. And I can tell you, my relationship with Kevin goes back probably 20 years. He was a president of an inventing group in Orange County. So he is a personal inventor. And he does my stuff along with a team of us at Fishbone, which are getting patents right and left now. And he does a fantastic job. So he really watches our back. And, and that's the type of person you want that's that you're going to be working with, no matter if it's Kevin or somebody else in the industry. You want to find someone that really cares about you. And, and Kevin is one of those individuals. Kevin's also told me that out of all the people, all the Pat or the patent agents or the pat is the patent agents or patent are just patent practitioners. Just law firms across the country. Okay. He's he's ranked number nine of getting design patents. Yeah, for the last 12 years or so. Number nine. And and there's a lot of patent agents out there, and there's a lot of patent attorneys out there. So that's a great uh accomplishment. Thank you know, thank you for mentioning that. Congratulations, Kevin, for for getting such a prestigious award for that yeah well thanks and uh, thanks for the intro and you know i like design patents uh so i market towards the design patents and um i i'm glad that that's the topic today because uh there's a lot of confusion about design patents and uh, so hopefully we'll clear all that up in the next 30 minutes I, or so i want to explain a little bit how i use them real quick and then we'll jump into this presentation um i like design patents a lot they're affordable, they're easy to do, but they're just, in my opinion, one piece of everything you should do. And that's why I really like them because you know what it does? It allows you to build kind of this wall of IP. It could be utility patents, it could be design patents, it could be trademarks, it could be copyrights. But for me, when I start to protect something that's really important to me, I always include design patents. To me, it's the one-two punch Right, it's how maybe something's manufactured, maybe some of the utility, but it's also how it looks. So I really like that very much. One thing I do want to mention real quick: we're going to do something very special uh, at a quarter to the hour, but I'll talk about it a little bit later. So Kevin, go ahead. Let's hear all about design patents. All right. Well, thank you, Stephen. Welcome everyone. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, uh, I am an inventor myself. That's how I got into this business, and uh, there are actually three types of patents, generally speaking. There's utility patents, design patents, and plant patents. 
And you can forget about plant patents. I think I've seen one, you know, in 20 years. So uh, the, the two basic types of patents are design patents and utility patents. And really, when people are talking about patents in general, what they mean is utility patents. Utility patents protect how something works versus a design patent, which protects just the way it looks, regardless of how it works. So uh, des design patents do not uh, get into what kind of materials are being used, how those are connected together, how the thing operates. It's really just about what they call the ornamental appearance. And, uh, and so generally speaking, you would say, well, they're not as strong as utility patents. That's, that's probably right. But it's kind of like saying, you know, men are stronger than women, right? I've seen some pretty weak men and some pretty strong women. So uh, there are ways to make design patents stronger, especially with some of the court cases that have come out recently. So, uh, so we'll get into it. I, I want to show uh, really my example that I use for kind of highlighting what the differences are. And that is with spectacles or sunglasses. Now, if you look at the, uh, the, sun, the, the spectacles here, that has a particular look, right? But they work the same way as every other pair of, sun, of, of glasses. And so for something like that, you, you've got to have a design patent. In fact, you probably couldn't get a utility patent on that because it works the same way as the, uh, the standard uh, spectacles or sunglasses. Uh, compare that with polarized lenses which is the example on the bottom right. For polarized lenses, what you wanna protect there is how it works. And so for that, you would need a utility patent. Uh, you, you don't really care if you, have a, if you have invented polarized lenses, you don't really care what the competitor's products look like. If they're using polarized lenses, you wanna be able to go after them. And so that's kind of the difference. And uh, they are not mutually exclusive either. I've gotten both utility and design patents for the same product. They just protect different aspects of the invention. So let's look at one of these design patents. Um, this is a bag holder for the plastic grocery bags that you get so that you can carry 20 of them at a time. And this is a design patent. And you know it's a design patent because it starts with the letter D, the patent number up here. I don't know, can you guys see my mouse moving up there on that? Okay, good. Um, the letter D is the big tip off that that's a design patent. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is that these drawings don't have any numerical callouts. So I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And by the way, when you're looking at a patent, the front page of a patent, patent number is here, the issue date is up here on the right. And then you can look at the title and the, the inventor if there's an assignment, in other words, if the patent is owned by a company, that'll be on the front page. And this text right here, that's about it on a design patent. We don't have a lot of text that goes into materials or how it's used or how it's put together, different options. This is really just about the drawings and, and the text is a description of the drawings. So what you're looking at there on that one page is a complete design patent. That's it. Now compare that with a utility patent on the same thing. This is a utility patent on the same product. And there's a lot of text, right? We have some drawings, which I'll show you a little bit in, in, in large so you can see the more, more detail. But there's a lot of extra stuff that goes into a utility patent. That's why utility patents are more expensive to prepare because they take longer, you get 15, 20 pages of, of text uh, sometimes. Whereas with design patents, it's really just the drawings that you're doing. So zooming in on what the design patent drawings look like, they're actually more detailed. We have to have a shading on every surface. Notice also that where it says uh, here in figure three, ABC store, that is done in what we call broken lines. And so it's optional, it's not really there, it's not considered part of the claim. When you put something in broken lines, like your logo or something that's, that's not uh, something that a competitor is gonna copy, uh, then you're disclaiming that element from the design patent. 
So a design patent really is protecting only those things that are in solid lines, just if you're looking at them. Now compare that to a utility patent drawing. This is, you know, we're showing inside of it how it works. We're, we have a, you know, a couple of springs, a couple of, of spherical marbles or balls that, that push outwardly. And we're going into all that detail in a utility patent. Also, there's all these numeric callouts. You don't have that on a design patent. So let's get into some of the pros and cons of design patents. Um, for one thing, like I mentioned earlier, they're less expensive. Uh, and I'm just going kind of by our pricing, but you can you know look out to other firms and see what they charge. Uh, a design patent from start to finish is about $1,500 for 15 years of protection. That's a hundred bucks a year. So I think there's a, I think design patents are underutilized because there's a lot of bang for the buck there, uh, especially when there's not that much buck. Um, you know, it, it, I think that a lot of times people will, they'll, they'll put a lot of money into their utility patent, which might be fine, but don't think of it as an either or. I, I like the idea, if you have something that is suitable for a design patent, I like the idea of using design patent as well. And we'll get into some more reasons why that's good. Uh, because they're so, they're so uh, inexpensive, uh, it's easier to add patents to your patent portfolio. Uh, if you just have one patent, that may be okay, but it's it's more impressive if you have a patent portfolio. Uh, Stephen's uh, experience with Fishbone, I mean, we've, we're getting a lot of IP there, and a lot of those are design patents, but it builds out a big list of patents. And that can be uh, very uh, ominous for a competitor who's thinking about, you know, maybe I should compete with these guys. Well, if they have a whole list of patents that they're going to go up against, that should give them more pause than uh, just if it was one patent. Another advantage of the design patent is that it's it goes through the patent office more quickly. So if you've had experience with utility patents, you know, it could be a year and a half to two years, three years, if you're in a field like uh, computer software or business methods, it can be even longer than three years. And um, that's a long time to be patent pending. You just don't know what your protection is going to be. Whereas with the design patent, it's usually about a year to a year and a half. It's easier for the patent office to examine design patents. And so they're able to burn through them more quickly. There's also fewer of them filed every year. So what you may get is if you file both a utility and a design patent on the same item at the same time, or roughly at the same time, it's probably going to be the design patent that gets issued first. And so that would represent the first arrow in your quiver that you can shoot at a competitor if it's, you know, if they're getting too close to the way your product looks. You can also speed up design patents, just like you can utility patents through the patent office. The, uh, the program that speeds up uh, design patent at the patent office called the Rocket Docket program, and it it uh, they try to get to it within two to six months. And you do have to pay more uh, to the patent office to do that, but it might be worth it if you have uh, if you're in an area where there's a lot of competition and you're going to get knocked off quickly. You want to get your patent in your hand as soon as possible, so uh, that may be worth the extra expense. Here's an example of a rocket docket design patent that we had issued. Notice the filing date here is January 31st, 2019. And the issue date is July 9th, 2019. So what's that, just over six months. Uh, that's like top speed for the government. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. So the rocket docket system does work if you're in a pinch and you need to get a patent issued quickly. Another huge advantage of the design patent is that you're probably not going to have an office action uh, like you get with utility patents. You know, 95% of, uh, of the design patents are just allowed straight away. We don't have lots of issues with prior art. We, I mean, 5% of the time we do. And then that's a separate issue in how we have to deal with that. We have to respond just like we would on a, on a utility patent. But with utility patents, it's really the opposite. 95% of the time, they're rejected. And then you got to argue with the patent office. And ultimately, somewhere between 60 and 65% of the time, 
you can eventually get the utility patent issued. Those are just nationwide statistics. But with design patents, it's 95%. So it's much more of a sure bet. And if your licensing agreement says, you know, that you're going to get one royalty if you have something that's patented and another royalty lower if it doesn't get patented, or, or you have some kind of language in there that um, gives you an incentive to get a patent, a, a design patent might count, you know? Now, I'm not suggesting that you be dishonest in what kind of filings you, you've done, but the... Um, but the design patent can help with licensing agreements if they're worded uh, in a particular way. The other thing about uh, design patents is you can say patent pending. You don't have to say design patent pending. You just say patent pending. And sometimes just being able to say patent pending is what opens doors. Um, now, it's important to remember what patent pending means. Uh, the way I like to think of patent pending is it's like a big no trespassing sign on a piece of property that you don't own yet, okay? And so if you've filed a utility patent and a design patent, now you can legally say multiple patents pending. That's a little bigger no trespassing sign. And so um, people ask me all the time, you know, does that give me any rights? No, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a no trespassing sign, but you don't own the property. If somebody starts to copy you and they set up a lemonade stand on this property, you won't be able to legally evict them until you own the deed to the property. Okay. So that's the way I think of patent pending and, and when you get your patent issued. And if you're in a competitive uh, industry, you, you might want to do everything you can to get those patents issued more quickly. Now, the drawback of design patents is that they're, they're not as compelling to licensees. A lot of licensees uh, haven't gotten the memo from the uh, 2008 Supreme Court decision called Egyptian Goddess, which strengthened design patents. Um, a, a lot of licensees and a lot of business people in general uh, will, will say, well, design patents are easy to design around. That may be true, uh, depending on what the geometry of your product is. But if there's distinctive qualities about the way your product looks, and particularly if those distinctive qualities make it so that it can work in a certain way, that can be a strong design pattern. And uh, the 2008 Egyptian goddess decision changed the way they test for infringement in court. They're now using the ordinary observer test. And so I'm gonna show you some examples of, of how that works in court. Um, the, the, and like I said before, the design patent doesn't protect the way it functions. It just protects the way it looks. So uh, you, you want to, you can't even use design patents on things like uh, software methods or apps for your phone or chemical patents. It doesn't apply. So if you have a tangible product, it, it may, it's certainly worth looking at to see if a design patent would be an option but uh, it's not always an option. So here's an example of a case where the ordinary observer test uh, really helped. You can see everyone's familiar with Crocs uh, sandals, I'm sure. Um, on the left, we have the design patent drawings. And on the right are examples of uh, counterfeit products that a Chinese importer was bringing in and you'll notice that these are not exact copies of what the design patent shows. Uh, the holes have a different shape. They make a different pattern on the front of the sandal. The strap going around the back of the ankle is different. But when the judge looked at these and compared them, he said, you know, the average consumer, the ordinary observer is going to look at these uh, and think that these are Crocs. And so they were able to prevail in that case. Um, another very famous example is Apple versus Samsung. Uh, Apple won, I think the judgment was half a billion dollars from uh, Samsung for infringing the Apple design patents on the iPhone and the iPad. And the thing to note here is that the broken lines in the Apple uh, uh, design patent drawings disclaim certain elements. And so the only thing that's claimed on these patents, and there's about four of them uh, that protect different things, but 
the only thing that is claimed are those things that are in solid lines. So even though the Samsung Galaxy doesn't have the round hole, it had a, I think it was like an oval hole or not a hole, but a button. Um, you know, the, the, the court still found them uh, infringing those design patents. So real quick, I wanna run through what a design patent, what a good design patent looks like. So that when you're getting a design patent application from your practitioner, you can have a sense of what it you know what should be included. Uh, design patents typically need seven views. Uh, they need all six sides of the object. So here's a pair of jeans that we did a while back. Um, figure three here has is the front view. Figure four is the rear view. So front, back. This is, believe it or not, the left side. And that's how the patent office uh, wants you to call that. They, they call that the left side. It's not uh, as though you're wearing the pants that determines that. It's when you're looking at the front view, which side is on the left and which side is on the right. Go figure, it's the government. But uh, that's the left side view. Then figure six is the right side view. And then you have a top view and a bottom view. So you have all six sides. And then you also want, they also want a perspective view. Many people call it an isometric. So I was a little surprised by what Bortnikov said. Oh, someone's coming in. Then, you know, these toting extra hard. Uh, the perspective view is from an angle. And I like to show perspective views in use if possible. So you'll notice that we have the uh, person who's wearing the jeans in broken lines. We're not claiming that she's part of the design. Um, and then we also had a figure two. In this case, we had a different configuration where you can take this, the legs off and turn those into shorts. Hmm. Uh, here's another example of a, a patent that we did that has different configurations, a, a duck decoy. Uh, we had a floating position and a submerged position. So sometimes it's important to show those different configurations. Um, we can also, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize, is we can file a single design patent with multiple embodiments. Find a way to be together. So the uh, in this example here, this we argued to the patent office that this is the same design, that these are just two different embodiments. And if you're trying to figure out where the difference is, it's down here in these this bottom panel. And so those are close enough that the patent office gave it to us. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they say, well, those are really two different designs and you got to pick one and then you got to file what's called a divisional application on the second one. Uh, but if they're close enough, then you can get protection on multiple variations just with one patent. So that saves you money. If, they, if the patent office lets it through on the same application and, and grants it on the same patent, then you're in luck. Uh, now, here's the text part of a design patent. It's really quick. There's basically two things. There's the title. And a lot of people want to put their trademark in the title, and that's a no-no. The title has to be a boring, descriptive uh, title. That's not something that is a trademark or a brand name. So you wouldn't say Whizbang 5000 in your title. You would say, you know, Weed Whacker or something like that. And then you have the description of the drawings. And this is basic, uh, you can't really do much variation here. If it's a perspective view, you got to call it a perspective view and so on. And you just describe each of those views so that the patent office knows what you're talking about. And then if there's a broken line, you have to explain what that broken line represents. And then there is a claim in a design patent, but it's a single claim and the, the wording is fixed by the patent office. It's uh, I, we, depending on if there's co-inventors or not, claim the ornamental design for A, and that's where you put the title of the invention, as shown and described. That's it. So it's very simple. And then I'm just going to go through a few examples, uh, noteworthy examples of design patents. These are kind of fun. Uh, and I love the design. I love the artwork on design patents. So this one, everyone should recognize. This was a gift from France but they put a patent on it anyway. Uh, back then you only needed one figure to show in the design patent. So this was back in 1879, uh, design patent 11023. 
here's one that shows um, how you can, with shading, you can do some really neat contour effects. And that's one of the things about design patterns. Every surface has to have some kind of contour shading. So you know if it's flat or concave or or convex or you know how it's how how the contours look. And so this is just line art drawing, but it's it's I think it's a beautiful example. Here's one that uh, a lot of people will recognize from Disney. This is the Dumbo ride at Disneyland. And that's just one of the views. And I like this example because it shows what's called oblique shading. So this this 45 degree shading here on the glass cover indicates that it's a transparent cover. So anything that's transparent has to have this oblique shading. And of course you can see through it. This is a different kind of shading. It's called stippling and uh, it looks nice. I mean, that looks beautiful, but it is it is um, difficult to update if the patent office wants to make any changes. And sometimes they'll come back and say, you know, we don't like the shading on this surface or it doesn't match figure three or whatever. And so if you have to update your drawings, it's best not to have stippling because that can take a long time to fix. There are some times, and you'd think that we'd be in the 22nd century here already in the patent office, right? Uh, they like line art drawings. They don't like photos or renderings. And so, uh, so they uh, try to um, uh, encourage us as practitioners to use line art drawing. There are some cases where you just can't show the shading appropriately. This is a gold nugget hat we did for the, uh, uh, what was it, I guess the gold nugget casino. Um, and uh, it, it is a gold color, but that doesn't show through in the design patent because you don't want to limit it yourself to gold color if you if you don't have to. I mean, if this was green, it would still be protected. So, uh, but anyway, this shows kind of the the contours of this gold nugget. And you, I've never seen anyone wear this hat, so I don't know how successful it was. But there are some situations too where color is important, and uh, this was a case where. <laughs> We had a hard time getting it through. We finally uh, converted it to color drawings and that seemed to do the trick. But the patent office doesn't like color. They, they You have to file a, se a separate petition and get permission basically to use color. What they'd rather see is uh, like in this example, we have a fence stake and the top part of this you'll see is shaded. It has like this particular vertical line shading well, that vertical line shading represents the color purple. And in this case, this stake is uh, is where if you have reclaimed water lines running along the fence, you're letting people know that's reclaimed water. It's not potable water. So you have to have that kind of light purple color on the stakes. And so basically this inventor killed two birds with one stone. And in the uh, guide to filing design patent applications produced by the PTO, they give you some of the different uh, sh shading patterns to use for the different colors. Here's just some other examples of things that I thought were noteworthy. We did the uh, design patents for the Squatty Potty, uh, Judy Edwards. Uh, she's done real well with the Squatty Potty invention uh, and we did her design patents for that. This was another uh, product that was on Shark Tank. It was the Cool Box, which is a toolbox combined with a Bluetooth radio speaker or Bluetooth speaker. I don't know. I don't think they did a deal, but uh, but they did uh, get some notoriety. And this is just an example. This is from 1875. Now you'd think with computers and everything that we'd be able to do some really beautiful drawings, but you just don't see them like this anymore. I can't imagine how long this took. And the artists were at the time, you know, the, the artists on the patents are anonymous. You don't know who the draftsman is. So somebody spent a lot of time on this, turned out beautiful. Here's another one that uh, it's just gorgeous how they did that. In fact, I, I came across so many of these. I was doing, I don't know, maybe three or four patent searches a day at one point. And I was coming across so many beautiful patents. I went ahead and put them in a book called uh, The Art of the Patent. 
and we did a Kickstarter on it and, and it was successful. So that was a fun project. And then uh, later on, actually, just to show my kids how to do this, I, I did a bunch of playing cards. Each of the playing cards has a patent drawing on it. And it's public, you know, it's fair use. So uh, I didn't have to pay anyone royalties for the drawings, which was, uh, which was nice. All right, so that is it. That is a very quick intro. And um, if, you know, if anyone has questions, maybe. Yeah, Kevin, can let's do this. Um, yeah, take all, if you would stop sharing too. Um, thank you very much, Kevin. Wonderful. There's a million questions. Okay, so what I'd like to do is ask some of these questions. And then what I'd also like to do in about 10 minutes, do some breakout rooms. And I like to do a room, just um, this one particular room will be on design patents and Kevin would be there to answer even more questions for you. But before we sure. get to these breakout rooms and we'll have a couple different types of breakout rooms. I'll talk about those in just a minute. Hey, Kevin, here's the big question here. All right, I get a design patent, but someone changes it just a little bit, right? So what the happens with that? I'm a little, always a little confused. How much can they change it? And that they they would get around potentially get around what I have, right? So there is a point at which they can change it enough to get around your design patent. The question is where is that point? And in two thousand eight, that uh, Egyptian goddess case, it made the point further away. I mean, it, you know, the average consumer, if they're confused about who's making this product because it looks similar to yours, you probably have a good case. Got it. It has to be different enough so that the, the average consumer doesn't think. It's the same product. Okay. So what are the fees? You gave us your fees. Thank you very much for doing that. What are the fees, the average fees? What What about the USPTO? What do they charge? And are there maintenance fees to this too? And how long do, how long do I have a design patent for? Yeah, so, uh, so the design patent term is 15 years from the issue date, which is different from the utility patent. Utility patent is 20 years from the filing date. And plus or minus some extra time they might give you if they take a long time. So it's conf the utility patent side is confusing. Design patents are easy. 15 years from the dated issues. Okay. The, the, the filing fees for micro entities are $204. For small entities, it's $408. And if you're a micro, en micro entity and small entity, it's kind of confusing. Um, okay. You're a you're a micro entity if you've filed fewer than five patents in your lifetime, and you made less than three times the median household income last year, which comes out to like two hundred twenty three thousand and change. Okay. So if you're under those numbers, then you're paying the lowest fee at the patent office. You're a micro entity. So what about ma no maintenance fees. There's no maintenance fees on. Now don't jinx it by talking about it. We don't. <laughs> But no, there are no maintenance fees on design patents. Okay. And that can be several thousand dollars with utility patents. Well, yeah, the utility, those can get real expensive if, if it's year number 11, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, it can be $3,600 uh, for the one, the 11 and a half year filing fee, sure. Okay. Um, someone asked this question. I know things do change, but I'm selling my product on Amazon. Okay. And they typically knock, not, not only do they knock my product off, they knock my, my image. They take my picture. They, they take my look, they take my trademark. Man, they take everything there. They just copy everything. In fact, they take everything I've done and just take it over and they sell it themselves. Right. I know copyright. There's 50, of them. There's 50 guys doing that to you. Yes. So yeah. how, how helpful is a design patent? Oh, it can, it can be really helpful if they're, especially if they're, verbatim copying you okay then they're going to be copying exactly what you're doing right so there's no question that they're infringing your design patent um there are attorneys uh that uh like one guy in, in la he does uh, what he calls amazon law and he loves that's his favorite scenario you have a u.s inventor with a design patent or a utility patent or both 50 competitors have jumped on all from factories in china and okay. what he does is he gets an injunction and he locks up all their funds and then they just go away. And so there are ways to do that, but you do have to have some kind of a patent if you're going to protect the product itself. If someone's just copying your images and, and your, your wording, that's a copyright issue. 
Okay. And if they copy your trademark, that's a trademark issue. So, so you might get them on all three of those. So let's talk about non let's talk about public disclosure for a minute. I've got my product. I've been making it. I've been showing it for a while, but not quite a year yet. Can I still file a design patent? Yes, you have one year grace period in the United States and a handful of other countries. Now, a lot of countries like China don't have a grace period. So if you publicly disclose your product, you start selling it, or like what happened to my cousin, he had a product that was selling great in California. It was a firearms product. And so we, I think in week 50, we filed a patent for him. And he didn't realize that one of his beta testers had taken a video of how to assemble this on a firearm and uploaded it to YouTube. And the patent office found it. And that was more than a year before our filing date. And so we were out of luck. You know, there's no way to get that patent. So okay. you do want to be careful about the timing on these things. If you care about foreign patents at all, keep it a secret until you file your patents, both utility and design, if you're going to do both. Uh, if you don't care about foreign patents, you can launch the product and see if it's going to work in the marketplace, right? But I wouldn't dilly-dally filing your patents because we're on a first-to-file system now. I know. So Sorry. you do not want to be second in line at the patent office. No, uh, you, you don't get anything if you're second in line. Yeah, let me, you know, you guys, just so we're clear, I file my own provisional patent applications. I file my own trademarks, copyrights. I do all that. I don't file my own design patents, okay? I, I, I don't wouldn't either because you've got to have really good drawings. And so you need a draftsman who knows what they're doing. Yeah. No, it, it's more complicated than it looks, okay? So... That's why I wanted Kevin to come on because I'm pretty comfortable doing all of it. I won't do that part because I'm going to do it wrong and I have done it wrong and it gets kicks back and then I got to call Kevin in. I'd rather just call him at the very beginning to take care of it. And the, the, the scary thing is you can have filed fatally flawed drawings. I mean, it, there may be no way to save it if, if it's not done the right way. I've seen that, you know, and I, I got to tell the bad news. I'm sorry, we can't save this. You didn't have this view when your original file, you know. Okay, tell, let's talk about this. I, I've got an IP strategy here. I want to file a utility and I want to file a design patent. Do I do one before the other? Does one impact the other? They're completely separate tracks. So okay. um, if, if the, the easiest one to file is the design patent, we can get that done in a week or two. Utility patents take longer because of all the wording. So if you're starting... Today, we can probably file your design patent first and then a few weeks later file your utility patent. Okay. But if you've um, if you've already filed your utility patent and now you're thinking about following it up with a design patent, all those grace period and all those time periods are are still in play. That's just they're separate for each type of patent. So Kevin, here's a big question. Now I, I live, I'm up here in uh, Lake Tahoe. Do I have to visit you in Las Vegas? I mean, that seems ridiculous now. And I know a lot of us want to be really close to our patent agent or patent attorney. Is that even, do, why, why do people even care anymore? Or do they? Or should don't they? You want to, don't you want to come to Vegas? Well, no. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, I do. But Okay, so so no, the answer is no. We can do it right, right here on Zoom. You can send me the, the CAD drawings, the photos that we need. Um, I have clients in every state. So, you know, you don't have to come visit me, even though that may be attractive. <laughs> I know. For some reason, a lot of us think that we have to, you know, I've been filing patents for a long, long time. I think I visited my patent attorney one time and I realized I don't, I never want to do that again. I want to be short yeah. to the point and send him an email. That's what I want to do because well, I end up talking too much. Yeah. And we started, uh, and they'll bill you too. Yeah. Uh, you know, we started in Orange County, California. That's where I was raised. And, and you know, that's a very innovative area. And uh, I thought, you know, can we really move out of here? But it's been fine. I mean, I, I can do anything over email, phone, Zoom. Okay, now, okay before we get to the groups, I'm going to be really quick. Now, now, you're a patent agent. Now, maybe I want a patent attorney. What's the difference between the two? So uh, uh, both patent agents like myself and patent attorneys have a four-year science or engineering degree. So I have an engineering degree out of Berkeley. Um, oh, Ber Berkeley. Berserkley, yeah. Okay, and okay. Uh, a patent attorney additionally has a law degree. And so 
the way it's set up, the way the, the intent of Congress when they created patent agents was that I could represent clients to the patent office just like an attorney. I can do everything that an attorney can do at the patent office with regard to patents. I just can't take it beyond the patent office in the court oh. and sue somebody for infringement or write a cease and desist letter okay. or even do trademarks. They don't let me do trademarks. They consider that the practice of law. So okay. I can just do do two things. I can do patent searches and write patent applications and get them through the patent office. Got it. Well, we we want to avoid the court system, so we're, we don't we want to yeah. avoid that. So, okay, guys, we're going to do something really different. We're going to break out in some smaller rooms with different topics. And so, one of the rooms that we're going to break out, we'll have Kevin Prince. If you want more information about design patents on a, in a smaller group where you get to know Kevin, that's going to be one room, right, Ben? The second room is going to be, I'm going to be in the second room that if you have any problems getting into companies, for some reason you're not getting in and you don't know what's going on, I, I will be in that room to give you some tips and advice. The third room will have my partner, Andrew Krauss. He's going to trade shows. He's talking to companies. He knows what's happening. He knows what's hot. He knows what company's out there. So if, if you're curious about an industry, if they're mentor friendly or what's going on, Andrew's the guy that can help you talk about an industry, how to get in, all that kind of great stuff. That's Andrew. He's in the third room. Now, we have the ability to have a fourth room. If you'd like to have another topic I did not mention, would you put that in the chat right now? We can, because we've got a person here that can run that fourth room for us. Let's see what we get. What, yeah, and what, so and what's going to end up happening, everybody, is I'm going to stay in this main room. And as soon as I open up all the breakout rooms, you will notice on your bottom toolbar for Zoom, right next to where it says show captions and all of that, there is a four squares that says breakout rooms. Whenever I enable all of these, you will be able to go down, click on that, and then click on the room that you want to join. Okay? Kevin, you'll be room number one. Steven's room number two. Andrew's room number three. Elliot, um, yes, you can jump back up and back with uh, uh, different rooms. Any room you want to, if you, if you go on Steven's and he's boring you and you hate listening to it, you can jump over and, and go visit Andrew. It's no big deal. We're just wanting to help accommodate everybody best as we can. There's a um, uh, LinkedIn is, is something that Celeste is asking for. That's something that I can absolutely cover in the main room if you want to stick around in the main room. And if what I would like to do, unless we get an incredible suggestion, is I would like to get Elliot over in room four for people that want to get to know other inventors. You want to do a little networking, take two minutes Talk about yourself for just a second. Share your LinkedIn uh, URL. Connect with each other. Get to know each other a little bit. If that's hey, cool, that sounds hey ben, I, acceptable. I saw, I saw one of the comments was patent searching, so I can handle any questions on patents, uh, patent searching, awesome. utility patents, whatever. I want okay. to, speak to just yes, this. This will be recorded and it will be up on our a couple of YouTube channels too. I, I want to. Okay, you want me to start right. the recording, Stephen? Yeah. What's that? I can stop the recording right now. To well, where it's Stephen, a just more just to be just to be clear, the the breakout rooms aren't going to be on the recording. No, the breakout room. rooms right. will not be. Right. right. Okay. Let's go to the breakout right. so rooms. Pick your I'm, room. I'm opening all the rooms right now. If you go down, you'll notice in that little toolbar there it says 99 plus right now. Yep. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that then you can go join whatever breakout room it is that you want by clicking the blue join. I'm going to stay here. If anybody has any uh, LinkedIn questions, any questions about that? Steven, you scroll all the way down to the bottom. Uh... And SK getting into companies, you'll see a little number. It says six right now to the right of it. It says join. If you if click on, on that... If you're on a cell phone, it might be like up towards the left hand corner. It'll have like yeah, four little. Oh, I see it. Okay, thank, thank yeah, you. Guys. I'm gonna Everybody go jump into that? room number number three, guys. So I'll see you. And in there. hey, we're gonna take maybe twenty minutes, something like that, and then we'll all come back and uh, uh, and say goodbye. 
I don't see the blue. I'm in number. I don't see my room. It's up there. It, if you scroll down, Stephen, uh, yeah, all, all the way, way down the bottom. So you're seeing Andrews. You need to scroll. Everybody's already in your room. That's the problem. You scroll up a little bit, look for SK getting into companies. There's a little blue thing over to the side of it that says join. Hold on. Where is that? Where is that? I think Andrew's you over in you his. You need to share your screen, uh, Benjamin. <laughs> do you want me to do that for you real quick, Stephen? I'm trying to find my room. I'm like, Stephen, I don't see the room. Oh, I see it right there. Here. Yeah, if you, if there, we got a lot. A lot of people on here. So what you need to do is click that little thing where it says breakout rooms, Sharon. At, at, okay. It's either in your uh, on your toolbar. You see where it says 63, 62 now. And if you scroll down, then you'll see uh, a list of all the different uh, rooms eventually, and then the number of people that are in them. I had to click the more button, and it came up with the choice that says join break. Okay. Oh, there you go. It might be a little different depending on if you're on a cell phone or if you're on a computer. Thank you for that, Serena and Kelvin, yeah. uh, for for bringing that up. Karen, hopefully you can figure that out, and hopefully everybody's able to go hop over there. If you're not, yes. sorry, you're just stuck with me, Sharon. No. Uh, but <laughs> Thank if... you. But no, that clarified it to click the more button, and then uh, it came up. So thank you, Perfect. whoever said that. Perfect. So cool. uh, every everybody, some people need to go join, jump in Elliot's room. Go do a little networking. Elliot's amazing. Uh, I would really recommend going and jumping in over there. Uh, it's the yeah. room at the very bottom. To, to level Elliot, Elliot is an awesome uh, member of the inventing community who is is really good at networking, and. Uh, I would really recommend people jump in over there. And if you want to just get to know your fellow inventors a little better, that's what I would I'm jump gonna, in on. I'm going to jump over there, but um, I love the the LinkedIn community, like, you know, the, how to network with LinkedIn. So hey, hop, I might jump in over there. Talk about Elliot. Elliot's great at it. I've taught Elliot everything I know. He's, he's Elliot's amazing. I would recommend it. And feel free to hop back. Uh, do whatever you want. Celeste. I'm going to unmute you. You're the one that recommended this. Anybody that has any questions, um, please feel free to enter that into the chat and I'm happy to answer those. Uh, and if you, or you can just raise your hand uh, physically or virtually and I'm happy to, to uh, call on you. Celeste, you're the one that recommended this room in the first place. Good to see you. Been a long time. I know it's a different uh, area or a different time zone wherever you're at. So thanks for thanks for joining. What are your LinkedIn questions that you have that I can help uh, that I can help cover over here for you? Okay, thank you very much, Benjamin, and hello to everybody. Yeah, it's about two o'clock in the morning my side, so um, my alarm clock is now very well behaved and it's well trained. Um, Benjamin, I've just joined a new company and um, I need to use LinkedIn to network as well as to identify people, uh, the main players. Now, if I was to take one of my areas of, in, of, of, of endeavor, it would be the corporate social responsibility people. I probably know the answers to the questions that I can't really articulate, but how would you approach a, 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 a brand new a brand new focus. Um, I'm going to probably go to LinkedIn and what um, Google, the CSR managers, LinkedIn education. This is because those are the main sectors that I want. Would I just do that? And then would LinkedIn come up with a list of people that I could contact? Yeah, so and we can maybe even do a screen share, Celeste. Maybe that might even help to help this out a little bit. You are saying that you in your uh, what it is that you're trying to do right now, you need to find people uh, specifically that do what? Uh, corporate social responsibility, sustainability. I'm looking for funding, fundraising, grants, 
um, money. I'm working for a foundation that educates um, underprivileged communities. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. So, so in, in, in robotics and coding. So um, I'm now wanting to target a specific area for a specific reason, and I'm looking for money, but I'm looking for the right names. Um, and and uh, as I said earlier, I could probably work this through, but I'm not quite sure how to even start my program of, of seeking. So do I just go to Google, put in my four main focus points, and will Google come up with enough names yeah, for that's... me to start? Well, what I would do is I would start looking for the organizations that you're going to need to to uh, hit up for that that type of of search. Do you have any idea who those foundations are? Because what I would do if I was in a scenario like that is I would get an idea of the companies that I was going to be reaching out to. I'll get an idea of the people that donate to that. And then I would find those organizations on LinkedIn and do a search for them on LinkedIn. And then I would find the people that work for those organizations. And then I would start connecting with them. And okay. from there, the ones that connect with me, I would ask them, so who is it at your foundation that handles new, uh, you, you know, new opportunities like this? Okay, that's, I was looking. That's into... basically how I would break it down. So I'm sorry. What were you saying? No, I was going to say thank you very much. I was looking at it from the person. Then I will find out the company because I don't quite know which companies are available for sponsorship or funding or partnership or whatever. So, what I could then probably do using your advice now is obviously there are large companies like, shall we say, Coca-Cola or Siemens or the, the, the big, the, just big corporates, international corporates. I could man narrow it down to the fact that they might have a, a head office or a branch office or whichever they call it in South Africa. The last? Yep. Can I make a suggestion? This is Bernadette. I'm based in San Francisco. I love it, Bernadette. Very... I'm very familiar with nonprofit organizations, primarily because I am in, you know, product innovation, except I don't know what to do with myself, my other, you know, products. But let me go to what you're asking about. LinkedIn is a great organization to seek out people, but start with the larger organizations that have been around forever, UNICEF being one of them that specifically targets children throughout the world globally. So get familiar with the UNICEF organization. And then there are wonderful organizations and a lot of them are have the large uh, enterprise companies, Fortune 1000 that participates in them. So if you target what are the Fortune 1000 companies, look up which ones you're interested in because you know have some familiarity, you mentioned Coca-Cola, things like that. Look at what they're participating in, because then that helps for you to now start and draw out from those companies what their interests are and where they're putting their money in order to support children and you know all the diversity uh, efforts that they're doing. You're sure. welcome to connect with me. I'm happy to um, help you on LinkedIn. Okay, that's, that's great, great advice, Bernadette. Thank you. I don't know that much about nonprofit. I don't know that much about you know funding yeah. nonprofits, all, all that stuff. So yeah. I'm a little limited in in my um, my ability yeah, was, to help. So thank you so you. much. Bernadette, sorry, what is your surname, please? David, D A B A D. Sorry, say it again, please. D A B I D. David D. Uh -huh. A, A V I D. I, 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 on LinkedIn, and you should find me. Thank you very much, Bernadette. And Thank feel you. feel free, uh, Bernadette, to uh, put your LinkedIn uh, URL in the chat if you can, if it's easy enough for you to do, and uh, Celeste may be able to find you that way. Yeah, uh, Nicole, you have your hand raised. I don't know if you have a question or if you have some more advice or an. an I did have a question also when you have a Absolutely. minute. Oh, 
<laughs> hey, you you've already been <laughs> helpful. Really so you've already got some <laughs> You know, my question so what's is up? this. I have been, you know, working with the large companies like the Microsofts and everything, and sadly old enough to be able to say, I knew them when they were baby companies, right? And I'm in the innovation part. That's what I, my specialty is. How did it keep being out there and, and be uh, relevant today because of product innovations that I'm involved in? But here's what my problem is. I also have a lot of, I'm a designer as well as a technologist, and I have a lot of ideas that I have not had time over the last 20 years, but would love to have time today to work with a mod, like a 3D modeler and all that kind of stuff. I would rather have somebody try to execute it for me than me try to find the time. Do you have that kind of, su any suggestions on how I could get started and be the inventor myself? Oh, can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, it, my my Anatolian Shepherd Great Pyrenees rescue was barking in the background for a second, so I muted myself. I apologize. Uh, she she's vocal. So, what I would recommend is I wouldn't try to get uh, 3D modeling done for every project. If you have a bunch of different ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a bunch of different things that you're wanting to to work on that you want to I test, because that can get They're really all expensive. in my sketchbook. I have sketchbooks with all sorts of r r notes on it, how they function and things like that. Yes. And so, so I don't mean to beat the virtual prototype horse uh, uh, or like, you know, get pound that drum over and over. But like, that's what I would recommend doing in, in your scenario is, is, especially if you have a lot of ideas because yeah. i know how expensive 3d modeling can be so i would try starting with your you know narrow it down to like three to five okay. and then start working on taking your sketches that you have oh my goodness it's courtney uh just hopped on my Hi. goodness gracious <laughs> <laughs> awesome to see you, courtney um, and then what i would do is i would try to uh I would get virtual prototypes made off of those sketches and then start pitching that and see what gets traction and what doesn't, and then start to work on 3D models from mm. there. Yeah. Um, okay. Because it can get expensive. Uh, yeah. vir doing a bunch of virtual prototypes can get expensive. Yeah. Depend, yeah. you know, not, it's not, not all of us have unlimited resources. So, yeah. That's where I would start, Bernadette, is I would I would narrow it down to three to five of those awesome ideas. It sounds like you have a ton of experience and you know been around for a minute. So these are probably mm -hmm. really well thought through. I yes. would get those sketches to somebody that could produce some good virtual prototypes for you. Okay. And then I would start pitching those to see what hits, what doesn't. Yeah. Because in the process of doing that, you're probably going to learn a little bit about the the product and uh, maybe you need to make some changes. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe you have another idea because of a comment that somebody has as you're pitching yes. it. And then if you've spent all this money on a 3D modeling for it and now you need to make some change to it, it can uh, really start to rack up a right. lot of... Uh, um, uh, you can rack up a lot of cost. So that's what I would yeah. do is okay. I would narrow that down what it is that I actually wanted to spend my resources on by spending a little bit of the resources, spreading it over three to five right. concepts and then pitching those. And then you'll be able to tell what's going to be easy and what isn't. And then focus on if they do need a 3D model, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But it or or uh, then you can actually start to allocate some funds there, um, Courtney. I continue to get uh, Frank asking for help <laughs> in Kevin Prince's design room. I may, if you're cool, leave you here for just a second and jump over there in that other breakout room really quick to see if I can help out. Uh, I don't know what you're. I don't know when it is that you joined or why it is that, that uh, uh, you hopped on. I'm thrilled to see your face. And anybody that doesn't know Courtney, she's as pro as it gets. 
Um, so, uh, Courtney, you just joining us just for the fun of it? What's going on? Yeah, um, I just, yeah, I have about like 20 minutes and was just going to join in and see what the, the party was, was all about. I didn't know there were, there were rooms or, or what the deal is, but I, I'm here for just being here. Okay, awesome. I love it. I, I'm here for that. Uh, Nicole has a question. Nicole, do you want to go ahead and ask it? I'll just stick in here with you. Uh, You're welcome yeah. to go join I, another room if you want. Uh, yeah, that's Courtney, I want to know like, how exactly you join another room. I was I'm, I'm looking at the Zoom interface and trying to figure out where are the rooms. <laughs> So you're asking me how you can leave me. That's your question. Is you're, is you're wanting to know how you cannot have to listen to me anymore, Nicole. Uh, so are you on a desktop or are you on a... Uh, desktop. Mobile device? Okay, so at the bottom of your screen where it says polls... Oh, God, there they are. There they okay, are. You got it. I see that. Okay, got it thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll shut up now. I guess I'm muting. Hey, <laughs> no, no problem. You don't need to shut up. Uh, Celeste, did you see Courtney. my LinkedIn link? Celeste, did you did you, did you see the LinkedIn link that she sent you? We got people making friends right and left, Courtney. People. <laughs> okay, and there it is. I look for it now. Sorry, it's in the chat. Good. I didn't see it. I was not looking. Yes, I see it perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. And Bernadette, thank you so much for helping Celeste out with that. Uh, like funding no and nonprofits yeah. and all that stuff this is not my area of it's, expertise it's at all. It's a big area. If anybody, in, in fact, have any inventions or ideas specific to targeting this kind of thing that uh, Celeste is trying to do, um, I am the one. <laughs> I, I know a lot of these organizations. It's awesome. Thanks. Hey, send me, if we're not already connected on LinkedIn, send me a... a, a connection request as well. It'd be, it'd be great to connect with you. Awesome. We'll do. All right. Courtney, what's going on? What's up with you? Uh, anybody that has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Anybody that has any questions for Courtney, especially, please feel free to ask. Uh, Courtney's out there just killing the game right and left. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the, the woman never stops. Do you have a do you have anything recently that you'd like to to share with everybody that is, has been um, really powerful for you and your journey? Anything that's really helping you out a lot that you'd like to share, Courtney? Um, I mean, there's a little bit of difference on what I'm working on, like project wise, compared to like where my students are are really stuck. Um, in relation to my students, is a couple of podcast episodes that I put out on my podcast um that uh, i've had a lot of students really frustrated with those things like re responding versus reacting to companies that was a really big one that i my podcast is basically on essentially how many frustrations i have with my students and finding ways to move those frustrations to the podcast so i can talk about the way through so other people can also hear from a third party perspective so oh like you know that's that makes sense but a lot of people don't know me so you know that that can really help with with that perspective so a lot of my frustrations are on there and my most recent frustrations have been people reacting to emails from potential licensees and not professionally responding uh, because they've mm. got the emotional aspect first and they're not thinking clearly so the critical thinking totally gone uh, rational mm. thought totally gone responding too quick think the response was brilliant they come to me they show me their response and i'm like what did you do like what happened to waiting and talking about it um so I did a podcast episode on that recently to, to help explain the importance of waiting and responding, not reacting emotionally. And then ghosting was another one that I... I man, oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, man. Both of those are so... <laughs> such common things, uh, common issues. Like, I... I don't know. I consider myself a pretty even-keeled person. Like... I, I try to keep my blood pressure in check. I, you know, yep. do alternating steam rooms and, and cold <laughs> showers. And I mean, you name it, you know, I'm, I'm like trying my best to stay sane, but I'll read an email, a response from somebody and be like furious and ready to like, like, you know, like cuss them out. And then spend all night up like tossing and turning in bed mm. and just upset 
and then read it again the next day before I respond. And it's, I read it the wrong way. Yep. And there's so many times that I've been super, super happy that I took the time to actually take a second before responding because man, really is everything. once you burn a bridge, yep. nobody That's like it. respond one time yep. in anger and you will never win that person back. It's true. Um, it's, it's hard. So I've, I've, talked to, I've, I've talked to so many students who have said that they were really excited and they just, they could not wait. Um, and so it brings up these hard conversations of, do you really like, why are you here? Like you want to, you want a deal? Like you want a licensing deal? Like, is this truly your goal? And it's like, yeah, of course. Like, it's, yes, I want a deal. And then we talk about like, what happened to all the, the advice that I, I gave you before this to make sure you don't do this. And then you <laughs> did this. And then we get into these hard and long conversations of why, why? Because I thought it was the response, like it made sense at the time. And then we get into psychology and we talk about your emotional thought goes way faster in your head uh, chemically than rational thought. So you will think it's the right answer. It is going to make sense. It does. You will write it out. It's going to sound great. And you're going to be like, perfect. I don't need to ask my coach. Like, it makes sense to me. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. But knowing that it runs quicker, if you wait, and I, personally, I'm, I'm a fan of trying to wait at least a couple of days, if not like a three day kind of thing. Um, lots of wow. companies are slow moving ships. They're not going to, they're going to, they're going to forget about you. The minute they send the email, you're gonna have to remind them who you are anyways. So you might as well wait a couple of days. Think about a good response. You can write it up and get the emotional stuff out on, on, on paper or type it up. Just don't send it. I can almost guarantee you, almost guarantee is not going to be the response that you're ever going to want to write if you just give it a couple hours a couple days it's like wow like there's so many opportunities missed purely because i'm seeing a lot of my students reacting and then i'm i'm very into the details so i'm like okay what did you say where were you with that company and then hearing their response back of what they said is really it's hard for me as a coach to to watch that happen and of course, because it's happened so many times upon me talking about it before and after it happens, uh-huh. now I'm like, screw this, it's podcast time. So now I'm giving my podcast to people to, to hear it from a little bit of a, a different, more scientific perspective to hope that they they get what I'm trying to bring across. And, and people that don't know this about Courtney, Courtney is uh, into Brazilian jiu-jitsu and so she's really quick to want to put people in headlocks she doesn't look like she is she looks really (laughs) nice but she responded to courtney the wrong way in an email and it is headlock 30 it's maybe time for an arm bar it it goes off really quick and so for anybody that's just you know on this we're randomly just kind of you know shooting the shit talking here but it's controlling your emotions throughout the process of trying to to partner with people uh is probably the hardest aspect of being an independent inventor that i can yep that i've seen after you know several years of, of working with people it's a it's a challenge because you have to care you have to be passionate you have to have drive. You have to be a little crazy about what it is that you're trying to put out there in order to have the passion that it takes to, to push forward and, and make it work. But then a big part of that is checking that passion and checking that emotion and knowing when to, to be able to control that and turn it on and turn it off. And it's, it, it's really difficult. So I really would love for, to suggest Everybody go check Courtney's podcast out. She's uh, does an amazing job. Yes, yeah, Celeste, you know. Celeste in, down there in <laughs> South Africa, she knows. Um, uh, Courtney, uh, the other you, – so you were saying uh, you like to wait a minute to respond. That's a little counterintuitive to what a lot of people uh, mm-hmm. uh, think – and even what other people will say, they're like, oh, you get a response, you got to jump back on, you got to bop, bop, bop. I agree with you. And 
have people disagree with me about it, but like, uh, everybody's got to find their own rhythm, right? Yeah. And so what I would recommend is maybe not wait three days for every uh, response, but if you find yourself responding emotionally, if you if you're if you're going like this on your keyboard or on your phone, if you are huffing and puffing, if you're in that place, that's when you don't respond. If you gotta wait yep. five days yep. to where you're not responding from that position, it's not even a, a set number of this is how many days you're Correct. supposed to wait in between each return. It's if you are responding out of emotion yeah or if you're like oh see things my way whatever if you forget that you're trying to come across as a team player sit on it there's so Wait. many different situations that's what's so hard is because the advice for this is very one on one i if if any of my students were here right now they would say that i talk specifics i cannot give advice until i know what is the company what are all your your communications you've had what is your title when was the last correspondence how many days has it been read the whole yeah, thread until i know yeah. exactly what's going on i could say one day i could say 3 days i could say 2 weeks i could say let's respond now on the call but without knowing the exact situation that's going on, you can't take this this generalized sweeping advice because it's almost always inherently going to be inaccurate. The only thing I can comment on about it is because so many people respond emotionally and often because they're just excited. A company responded back, holy cow, I'm going to go ahead and give this response. They're waiting for me. Like, I got to get to my computer. Like, what am I going to say? And if you are emotionally mature enough to write a professional response and you know that you will not be missing an opportunity, then go for it. But there are so many missed opportunities, especially because you don't know where they lie. And a lot of this comes in because they ask a simple question and you assume you know the answer, uh, but the ball is in your court when they are waiting for a response from you. They're waiting for you. You have the power of words to be able to respond, to not miss any opportunities. It's a great, it's the best place to be in mm -hmm. when they are waiting for a response from you. So why are we giving our power away in a minute? Why are we running over so fast and not strategizing and say, oh my God, I got the power back. Great. I'm going to throw the power back at them. Like, wait, we got to think about this. There are so many opportunities here, depending on exactly the language that they say. We, we need to think about the words that they use, not just the question that they're asking, but how best we can formulate the response. Even if the, the answer is still going to be yes or no, it's about the words that you use because we're developing a relationship. And if you're not spending the time yeah. developing a relationship, why have the power anyways when you're just going to give it up? I love it. Thank you, Courtney. Um... <laughs> what a great reminder. Hey, I'll, what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to set the timer off to close all of these rooms up to get everybody in this main room again. But I uh uh yeah, everybody like take what Courtney just said and don't immediately respond to her in anger about it. Uh but uh th think about that. No <laughs> No, remember, remember that the, like, the most important thing that you can be doing is building relationships with people. Because I've done business deals based on people just wanting to do business with me. And I've also not been able to get stuff done based on people not wanting to do business with me. So there's they can go either way so if you have those opportunities don't think about it of, of how can i look the smartest in my response or how can i prove somebody wrong in this or whatever it's how can i handle this in a way that's not going to shut this conversation down how can i handle this in a way that's going to promote further conversation uh rather than rather than shutting it down because once you once you shut that down, it's really hard to open back up. I'd like to welcome everybody back. Steven, you're still muted. I know you want to brag about how your room and Kevin's room had the most people in it. And I know I'm like, I got to give you an opportunity to gloat about that. Uh, and I want to just 
thank everybody for participating in this. You're, you're muted as well, Andrew, but I just want to thank everybody for participating in this uh, test that we're running. Um, Stephen, yeah. what do you think? Well, well, first of all, I don't know how many people were in my room, Benjamin, but who's counting? Um, but I, I do want to say that um, I want to call out somebody here. Jennifer, are you still with us? Where are you? Jennifer Bell. I see her. I see her. Hi, Stephen. I'm her. here. I, I didn't do it. I got I got to call her out here because we're she has been asking for something and I've been listening. I I just don't know what to do with it. And she says, Steve, you know, people want to gather more. They want to hang out more. And and I've been listening to that, and and I was I told my group when you first mentioned that, what do I do with this? And I was very happy that you even mentioned it because what you said to me is that that people care, and that was really important to me. And I started thinking about well, how do we do that because people want to connect. They, I think they want to build partnerships. I think they want to meet each other. I think they want to help each other. I think they want community. And even though at InventRight, and now this is not InventRight. Even though in event right, we do a lot. We have office hours four days a week. We have classes. I mean, we do so much, but I could tell Jennifer wanted more. So we decided to try this breakout room a couple of weeks ago. Benjamin did, and he just kind of did it, and it kind of worked pretty nice. And we thought we'd try it again on a public site just to see. Because I do believe what's happening out there that clubs are kind of closing down a little bit. Um, we're seeing that uh, the community's gotten smaller because people don't want to get out of their pajamas, I guess. I don't know. Um, people still want to connect and talk. And Elliot's been talking about it too. And so we wanted to try something different. And we want to think of how do we create where we can get together and we can talk in smaller groups how can we talk about prototypes or relationships? Or maybe you want a partner, or maybe you want someone to do this, or maybe it's just a way of having this really online inventing group that's talking and connecting and helping each other. So that's why we tried the breakout rooms, but it's really because of Jennifer Bell. There you go. I want to thank Elliot too for handling his own room. And Elliot was a uh very, very instrumental in all of this to Elliot explained to me, people like hanging out after meetings. People miss going to an inventor meeting, listening to a speaker, and then hanging out afterwards. You're out of the house. You're away from the spouse, the kids. You've made a, you, you're in the, you know, you've gone. And so uh, thank you for helping explain that to me, Elliot, because seeing it from that perspective really uh, help me to want to push forward in testing things. So thank you all. You know, uh, you, you know what else happened I, in my room? I, I We had so many good questions. And I think what happens is you realize people have the same questions you have. And so you get, uh, you realize that you're not in this alone, which is a, a really cool thing. So I liked it. It worked out really well in my room. I, I had a blast in my I room. Heard, I thought Kevin. people, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, everybody's great. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. I had a blast in my room. You guys had great questions. It was nice having a, a slightly smaller group than the whole the whole group. So people felt, I think, a little bit more open to asking questions. We had some great questions about trade shows, company expectations, about different things. Um, I really, I, I really enjoyed it, and I hope people. I see Derek's there. I, I'm on my phone. Because my computer well, if, crashed, so I see a bunch of people here that ask questions. So well, please great. comment in the chat um, if you think we should do more of this, or maybe we should do it separately. That we have breakout rooms and all these different topics, and it could be about prototype. It could be about anything you want. What I do like about this, though, is that um, some of the other things that we're doing, there's there's not a two way conversation ha happening there. You know, we have Discord, but you're doing something, you know, it's it's a keyboard. Okay, so what? Or LinkedIn is great, but we're 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 kind of putting information out, but we're not getting back. I, I want a two-way conversation here, you guys. And and Andrew knows um 
you know, for 20 years, I visited all the groups around the country for 20 years, guys. And I got to meet all the leaders and I got to meet a lot of you here. I get to meet, and, and I tell you, there's nothing like meeting people and, and sitting down and just say, hey, what's going on here? And I miss it, right? And hopefully we get back to it somehow, right? And um, because I think Zoom's great. We've already been, we've been a virtual company for close to 25 years. So we're kind of used to it, but there's nothing like getting together and just saying, hey, how are you? Because that type of relationship just goes so much deeper than a Zoom call, Skype call, or telephone call. It just doesn't go as deep. I don't, you know, and... And maybe we need to have a big conference where all some vendors get together. I do know this though, please link up to me on LinkedIn if you haven't already. We're we wanna build a huge community over there. We wanna connect over there because I'll tell you, if we all start connecting, we have a larger voice. And to get anything done in this world, you, you come together as one. You, you know, you guys, you know what's amazing? We have people from all over the world. We have Celeste, Celeste from South Africa. Celeste, what time is it there? You got your you muted, Celeste. Yourself. What time is it? It's half past two in the morning. You guys, it's wow. global. Yeah. It's global. <laughs> Our community is becoming global. And, awesome. and Stephen, I just want to mention Celeste had a question for me. And something, an area that I didn't have a lot of experience in. And Bernadette uh, was in the room as well, has an insane amount of experience in exactly what it is that Celeste had a question about. Now they've linked up on LinkedIn. She's going to help her out. This is what I see in Smart Pitch. This is what I see in the InventRight community. And it's incredible to see it on an even bigger scale because uh, you are all givers. Everybody wants to help. Everybody is uh, creative and and kind. And I think it's wonderful because uh, it's nice to see people come together and help each other out. Uh, so well, I want to applaud everybody for that. Thank you. Before, before we end, thank you. Before we end, I want I wanted to say welcome, Courtney. <laughs> uh, hey, y'all. And, and the reason why... And of all the coaches we have at InventRight, and we have amazing coaches, and we have amazing members, um, what we did tonight reminds me of a little bit of Courtney, and I'll tell you the reason why. Um, she not, not only does she help her students, her members, she knows them personally. And that's pretty rare. And, and I know she's smiling through this because this is coming closer to her world a little bit. I know, I see you. I see I see you, Courtney. I hear you too. So you guys, we're going to get there somehow. I, I just want to thank everybody. We had about 150 people tonight. We had 100 people staying for the breakout rooms. Congratulations, you guys. That was pretty awesome. It Kevin, thank awesome. you very much for coming on and helping us. My thank pleasure. you for helping us at Fishbone, getting those patents. They mean a lot to that company, and I'm proud to be part of it. And so we'll see you guys next month, okay? And we'll do another breakout session, right? If you have any uh, any ideas for different breakout rooms, any comments, put them in the chat now or send me an email at stephenkey at inventright.com, right? And I'll see you guys next month. Thank That's you, awesome. Ben. Stephen, is, is, is it okay if I stay for a second just to answer Michael and Elliot's questions? They yeah, had their hands. I know you days. stay for hours. You just keep staying. Hey, I, I got That's what you do. You do that with the smart too, switch meetings. Man. The other night, he has a meeting. He calls me. Yeah, it went, it went like three hours. I said, three hours? I said, what are you doing? All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. I'll see you guys next month. Ben's going to stay on. If you want to stay on, he's still going to be there. Bye, everybody. Thank yeah, you, everybody. I, I just, Thanks. I just want Bye to stay on for Michael's group. seat. Um, Michael, do you have a question? I just wanted to make sure to get to you before before we we close this out. Um, Appreciate it, Benjamin. Uh, Elliot, you're welcome to go first. Uh, I didn't know if Courtney was going to stay on. Mine was kind of related to what Courtney's talked about before. Uh, Okay, well, do you mind if we just let Elliot? Because I know Elliot has to run to yeah, Elliot. I was more than welcome. Thank, to first off, first, so. okay, awesome. Elliot, uh, speak your mind, cuz. Okay, well, thanks, Ben. And it was a, a pleasure 
hosting the room and, and we had a great time in there. So thank you for making it happen. Um, I do have something really quick just to share with everybody regarding design patents. Um, there is an initiative by the USPTO. It's just more like news that I think anybody who's interested in design patents may want to know. I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, it's a link. Um, make sure that it's for everybody there. Elliot does link? amazing patent illustrations for anybody that doesn't already know this about Elliot. If you have any questions about all of that, it's a Elliot's a, a wonderful resource and an incredible person to to deal with. Uh, he's uh, one great. of the kindest people you will ever meet. Uh, so, thank you for that. You're, you're welcome. Um, thank you for for the you know the kind words, man. It goes a long way. I. I, I was actually, I'm working on sets in between these meetings. So a lot of times I'm just illustrating while I'm like listening to the meeting. But anyway, um, the uh, link has to do with um, news from the USPTO that they're trying to simplify, speed up, and um, help designers get their design patents through the office faster and um, get worldwide protection. And so uh, if you uh, are interested, um, they uh, are having a meeting in, I believe Saudi Arabia, if I'm not mistaken, or um, it is, let me just click on the link real quick. They're having it in Riyadh um which is in saudi arabia okay i got that right so um essentially they're going to meet and have um a, a meeting with wipo um to discuss more details so that everybody can get on board in the world and get on the same page with design patterns and streamline the thing so check it out if you're interested i do have to go because i have to actually illustrate a 26 page set and I've only done six <laughs> of the pages so far, and it's due next week. So bye. Get to it's work, Elliot. Bye. <laughs> bye. See you, brother. See you. So Michael, Elliot has left, but or um, no, Courtney has left, but hopefully I can still help you with your question. And then I do need to run because I'm going to have to eat dinner as well. So please feel free to, to ask your question or, or make your comment, Michael. I appreciate it. Uh, did want to thank everybody, you know, for helping out like y'all do, do every night uh, that we have these meetings. And I agree, you know, you know, with us inventors, it's sad that we can't get together more often in all of our different cities and, and help out more. And I'm in San Antonio and we've just, it's just slowed down more and more. And it's sad. And I, I miss the meetings we used to have, and I'm hoping they pick up again here soon. Uh, I was just super excited when I heard Courtney talk about how, She's made relationships and bonds with these companies and her connections. And she started, you know, uh, she's been, I guess, how do you say it? When she's made, she made these connections and she started sending more ideas to them faster. And I have literally thousands of ideas and I can't figure out which ones to start. I was a former InventRight student back in 2015 and I only had, you know, I'd say like 2,400 ideas back then. And it's literally tripled. Is that it? Then. Yeah, <laughs> I know it sounds pretty bad. Um, but as bad as that sounds, I know, you know, not everything's, you know, new or novel. A lot of it's, you know, there's other ideas that are similar, stuff like that. So the, the things that are holding me back are like learning how to patent search and stuff like that. I've tried watching a, a bunch of InventRight videos and things like that. But uh, my former InventRight coach was, mm, Alex. Okay, Alex, yeah, yeah, uh, Alex, but yeah. read. But, uh, yeah. I was having a lot of issues going on in my life and I was having trouble communicating my, my struggles back then with Alex. But I've seen how Courtney's coached her students and you know the things she said in the videos. And it's just amazing how brilliant her and some of the other students are now 
and I've been trying to to get some funds together to join back up. And I want to know more about how they've been doing that because I'm the kind of person that's like, I'd love to, to take off like that. And I want to know more about I, how to do that. I, I love Celeste. I love Celeste's uh, uh, suggestion so far is choose the ideas you would buy. I mean, I I don't think it gets any better than than that advice. Uh, uh, Michael, with, you know, 1100 or a, a couple uh, thousand, uh, 2400, whatever, with that many ideas, it's really obvious that you're not going to be able to try them all. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have to pick. Well and so too, I know what I would do, Michael, is I would pick. Uh, uh, I know this. We've been traveling in a, a gigantic motorhome for almost four years now, all over the country, up and back, coast to coast to coast. And we've whittled down our belongings to what we can fit in this and a five by five storage somewhere. And you ask Ben, how did you get to the point where you got all your junk to that amount of space? And I'll tell you, multiple passes. It did not all happen at once. And so what I would do is I would take those thousands of ideas. You've got to get that down to to 25. Or you got to get it down to 50 so you can get it down to 25, so you can get it down to 10, so you can get it down to five to figure out what it is that you're going to pursue next. And how you go about that is doing market research and figuring out what, you know, there's, there's a long list of different things and, and Ventrite has all of that uh, on their site, how to choose the right idea. But I'm willing to bet, Michael, because your number is so high that you were in paralysis by analysis mode of not, not knowing even where to start. So you're going to have to start whittling that number down to get it manageable enough to where you can even start to move forward with anything yes and when i did that last time i joined the idea that i picked and alex was helping me with i wasn't as excited about and it, it, i went to move forward and and uh started having some success and at the same time there were three other companies that started three separate ideas that all had aspects of that idea and it just fell apart, and I gave up on hey, it. Hey, Michael, here's here's man. Don't give up on yourself, brother. Roadblocks yeah. and bad things happen all the time, but but man, if you're somebody that has that many ideas, uh, three ideas not going your way isn't gonna. It, that can't be the end of your story, big guy. Mm-hmm. You've got to find a way to keep going. You it, they're uh, so. Uh, we all encounter so many setbacks and so many frustrations in life. Uh, you're, you're not alone in that. I've had the rug pulled out from under me uh, countless numbers of times. Well, what you got to do is not give up on yourself and, sure. and know that you have value to the right people. And that just because something didn't work out in the past, it's not a character assessment of who you are. And it's not an assessment of, of, of your skills as an inventor or as a creative. And it's not indicative of how everything's going to go in the future. So what I would do if I were you is I would know that you have good ideas, know that you have, you know, have, uh, know that you have worth because you do, because nobody comes up with that many ideas unless they have a beautiful creative mind. But you got to figure out a way to get over those past setbacks and to not let them determine or dictate how you move forward. Find, find some ideas that, you know, whittle all that down. Jennifer's given some really good um, suggestions. So is Celeste in the chat. Take their advice get that whittled down to a manageable number and then go get yourself some wins. Go get some life back, get some wind back in your sails because I know what it's like to sit there after a couple of 
ass whoopings and defeats. And it just really, it's hard to imagine a world where there's any outcome other than that. But there are outcomes other than that. You just got to believe in yourself and keep pushing, bro. Uh, you, uh, as somebody with as many ideas as you have is uh, uh, the world needs those ideas. The world needs to see them. Don't give up on yourself. Don't do that to the rest of us. I appreciate so, it. So whatever it takes, brother, I believe in you. Everybody here, I'm sure, feels the same way. We all believe I, in you. I really believe we all have great ideas and we do have to get them out to the world. And that's why I was saying I, I'm excited to see all the great things that our coaches have been up to, that y'all are sharing. And I really feel that, you know, we just have to sh keep sharing those with each other and and just move forward and keep helping each other. And I'm just trying to figure Absolutely. out how to keep doing that. I mean, I, I try to share everything I've learned from the groups with each other. Every time we have these meetings, it's just sad that we don't have more of them more often. And I'm trying to figure out how to do that here, too. Uh, hey, so don't don't let any any negativity into your thinking at all. I'm thankful for the meetings that we have, Michael. I'm thankful for this moment right here. I'm thankful that I get to be encouragement for you that I know that I've needed before at times. It's a beautiful thing. Anybody else sitting here that feels the same way, I want to I want to tell you you're you're worth it. Your your ideas are worth it. Well, thank you, Alan. Thank you. All I know it all. feels otherwise, but but I, I believe in all of you. That being said, I gotta go. <laughs> uh, but you, hey, being a part of your creatives, uh, uh, being a part of your journey, uh, uh, it, it means the world to me. And I, I thank you, Michael, for for saying what you said because I know a lot of people out here need to hear that. And there's probably a lot of people that are in the same boat. Maybe they don't have as many ideas, but they've been frustrated and they've felt let down by other people. And that's a lot of what life is, but you can't let that stop you. Believe in yourself, brother, because I, I believe in you. Thank you. Everybody, Thank you. I hope Thank you have you. a wonderful Thank evening. You. Thanks for being a part of this. Um, thanks, Ben. Thanks for, thanks for uh, letting me be a part of your journey. Thanks for showing up tonight. Thanks for helping each other out. I look forward to seeing everybody again. I'm going to get off.